Hello, thank you very much for tuning in again and welcome to the second lecture of this course on probabilistic machine learning in which we're going to learn how to reason under uncertainty and more importantly how to teach computers to do so for us efficiently. This is where we are in the course. We've just passed the very first lecture. All of this is still ahead of us. What we saw last time is first and foremost that probability and the associated notion of uncertainty is not just a technical mathematical concept used in machine learning, but it's a much, much broader notion that applies to actually most of our daily lives and that is an important part of the process that we might describe as human intelligence. Or as Pierre Simon Laplace put it, life's most important problems are for the most part problems of probability. This includes scientific reasoning, it includes many societal and political decisions, and therefore it's no surprise that a part of computer science, machine learning, which aims to, in, to endow computers with the core aspects of human intelligence, has to deal with this notion of probability at its very heart. In the last lecture, we introduced a mathematical formalism for dealing with uncertainty, with probabilities. We did so by constructing a set of axioms that go back to Andrei Kolmogorov, which are at their heart a construction of uncertainty using sets and set theory or measure theory to distribute truth not to a single binary statement but to distribute truth between true and false over a spectrum of values between zero at totally, totally false and one at totally true. We saw that doing so primarily requires just to think about sets, just to construct a meaningful way to talk about intersections, sums and differences of, uh, of sets. And then to um, at, apply one, or actually two key notions to distribute truth over them. The first one is actually a relatively simple one, which is just to say that there is a finite amount of truth. You might as well say there is one, a unit amount of truth. And the other one is the key master idea called sigma additivity, which states that for two disjoint sets over which we have distributed truth, the probability assigned to their union has to be equal to the sum of their individual probabilities. This is really just saying that we want to keep track of uncertainty and not artificially add or remove uncertainty or probability purely due to operations on sets. So that talking about derived events should not allow us to construct um, additional truth. This gave rise to first a relatively straightforward theorem which is known as the sum rule which states that um, if you want to get rid of one of the variables in your reasoning system because you don't care so much about it you can sum out all possible values of this variable to get what's known as a marginal distribution by summing out all possible hypotheses for the other variables. Then we introduced 
another quantity called the conditional probability for statement A given statement B. This was defined in a statement that is known as the product rule, which says that the joint, so-called joint distribution, so the probability of the intersection of two sets, can be written as um, the probability for either of these two sets times this new notion called a conditional probability. Combining these two rules gives rise to the core theorem of probability theory, known as Bayes' theorem, which um, also has a philosophical interpretation yielding the so-called posterior probability measure for um, a typically unknown latent quantity x given some typically visible observable data d by multiplying the prior probability for this latent statement with the likelihood, that's a conditional probability, for the data to arise, to be true, if the hypothesis is correct, and a normalization, which is known as the evidence, a denominator in Bayes' theorem, which is the sum over all possible such joint explanations of other hypotheses and the one we care about and the data. What we, well, we didn't actually see it, but I essentially put it as a homework, is a very interesting aspect of this concept, which is that it extends propositional logic, or you might call that Boolean logic, depending on what your notion of Boolean actually is. So, in, in a classic propositional framework, we are allowed to put binary truth values, true or false, to uh, statements. So we can make a statement like from A follows B. That means if A is true, then B is also true. In our new notation with probabilities, we can replace this string with this right similar string, which is a probability, a conditional probability for B given A. We can say B is true whenever A is true. So the probability for B given A is 1. And so this is really um, a, a generalization of this propositional statement in the sense that the two reasoning directions that propositional logic allows still work. So the probability for B given A is 1. So that's st standard forward Re, um, modus ponens style uh, forward reasoning. If we know A to be true, then B is true. So if it rains, then the street is wet. It also allows the converse, which is modus tollens. So if B is false, then A is also false. So if the street is dry, it cannot have rained. But it's actually a true generalization because there is a continuum in between, which is something you can show as your homework, Using Bayes' theorem and the rules of probability, we can find that if we make this assumption, then the probability for B given non-A, the complement of A, is less or equal than the probability for B, which means that if A is false, B becomes at most less plausible. Note that it can also stay as plausible as it is. So, if the street, uh, sorry, if it's not raining, it becomes less plausible that the street is wet. And uh, the other way around, in the probability for A given B, so that's a conditional the other direction around, is larger or equal than the probability for A. So this means if B is true, A becomes more plausible, or at most it can stay as plausible as it was before. So if you observe the street to be wet, it becomes more plausible that it has rained. Now, as part of your homework, you will show that actually there is an even stronger generalization. So this statement, of course, is a limit case of this weaker statement, which is that the probability for B given A is larger or equal than the probability for B. So that means if A is true, then B becomes more plausible or stays at most as plausible as it was before. If we assume this inequality for our probabilities, for our real numbers between 0 and 1, 
Then we can again show using the laws of probability that we derived in the last lecture that um, if A is true, then B becomes more plausible. So if it's raining, it becomes more plausible that the street is wet, even if we do not assume that rain directly implies that the street is wet, only that it becomes more plausible. That's just the statement copied, basically, right? That's a trivial, trivially true because we've assumed it. But we can also see that the probability for B given non-A is less than the probability for B. So what we had up here still holds, even under this weaker uh, requirement. And the statement above also holds as before. And a weakened form of modus tollens also applies. If B is false, then A becomes less plausible. So if the street is dry, then the probability for rain, that it has rained, is reduced. In this sense, probability theory does exactly what we want. It recovers classic propositional logic in the extreme corner case, but it allows us to make much more subtle statements about the relationship between propositions, between variables. Now, just to be sure, you might be thinking that I'm bashing Boole here, but Boole was actually a very smart man. In fact, if you read Boole's original texts, then you can find in his um, investigations of the laws of thought, actually sections on probability. So you might think of Boole as the guy who did binary probabilities and propositional logic, but actually he knew about probabilities. This was, note, this, is, this was well before Kolmogorov, but actually after Laplace. So probabilities had already been discussed. And Boole actually talks in his own works about probabilities and he actually uses exactly the rules that we now use today as well. So for example, he says that his first principle of probabilities is that the probability of the occurrence of any event is one, sorry, if P is the probability of the occurrence of any event, then one minus P will be the probability of its non-occurrence. So that's our sum rule. Second, the probability of the occurrence of two independent events is the product of the probabilities of those events. This introduces the notion of independence, which we will actually talk about today. The third principle is the probability of the occurrence of two dependent events is equal to the product of the probability of one of them by the probability that if that event occur, the other will happen also. That's the definition of conditional probability distributions, similar to how Kolmogorov would define them. And his fourth statement, most maybe excitingly, is the probability that if an event E take place, an event F will also take place, is equal to the probability of the concurrence of the events E and F divided by the probability of the occurrence of E. So what this is, is Bayes' theorem. So Boole, if you like, was actually a Bayesian. So if you are a fan of classic propositional logic, maybe you should be a fan of probability theory as well. Now, unfortunately, there is also a problem with probability theory. Not a conceptual one, but a computational one. So let's think about a situation where we have two them, uh, more than two variables. So let's say, just for argument's sake, that there are 26 variables from A to Z, an entire alphabet, that we would like to make statements about. Now, the way this works in a classic propositional framework is that you assign a binary value to these variables. So you could say A is true, B is false, C is true, D is true, E is false, F is false, and so on. Of course, that's a bit trivial, what you are probably more likely doing is that you assign a truth value to a certain subset of these 26 variables and then you also use propositional statements like from A follows B or you define C as A and B or M is uh, the truth value of uh, K or F, right? And so, so by this process, you assign um, 
initial truth values to a certain part of the alphabet and then use the rules of propositional logic to semi-automatically derive truth values for the other variables in this alphabet. At the end of this process, you have assigned a truth value to all of the variables, or actually there might be some variables you haven't assigned anything to and then you might as well ignore them. And um, doing so requires how much storage? Think about that for a moment. Normally that's the point where I would like to ask you a question, but unfortunately we can't. So of course it requires exactly 26 bits, right? We have to store binary values for all the variables from A to Z. Now think about what happens if we extend this framework to the probabilistic setting, where now we don't just assign true and false to all of the 26 variables, but instead we have to assign a probability to every possible combination of true or false for all of these 26 variables. So how many of these are there? Well, there are two to the 26 possible configurations of these 26 variables and their truth values. So storing these requires us to store real numbers between 0 and 1 for 2 to the 26 different states. And 2 to the 26, for those of you who don't have memorized uh, all powers of 2 up to, I don't know, 100, 2 to the 26 is 67,108,864. That's the amount of numbers we have to store in our memory now. And that's not even getting into the fact that we have to store real numbers rather than binary ones, of course, which complicates the process even more. So, um, where storing, actually, so by the way, of course, we don't have to store 2 to the n numbers. We have to only store 2 to the n minus 1 numbers because the um, rule of probability, that probability measures sum to 1 over all of the hypotheses, so that the probability of the entire hypothesis space always has to be 1, of course, saves us from storing one of these variables. So we only have to store 67,108,863. So by moving from propositional logic to probabilistic reasoning, we have complicated our process from our reasoning process from uh, on the computational side from storing 26 binary numbers, so 26 bits, to having to store about 67 million floating point values between 0 and 1. So something like 67 megabytes rather than 26 bits. That's disastrous, right? Why do we have to pay this price? Well, because if we are uncertain, we have to keep track of every single hypothesis because every single one of them might be the right one. There isn't a unique single answer anymore. Whether that's a good or a bad thing maybe depends on your outlook on life, but it's a fundamental aspect of trying to be uncertain, at least in principle if you want to keep track of every possible hypothesis. So what we've just seen is that probabilistic reasoning extends classic propositional logic, but it also causes a massive new computational challenge. Instead of keeping track of a single binary string to store a single hypothesis we commit to, we now have to keep track of a combinatorially large space of hypotheses and assign a real truth value between 0 and 1 to every single one of them. Well, except for one, which we can construct by 1 minus the sum of all the other ones. This is the key challenge of probability theory and probabilistic reasoning. And if you want, then in a way, the entire rest of this course and more or less all research on probabilistic machine learning is in, at its core 
trying hard to deal with this challenge by making all sorts of simplifications, computational tricks, using structure, and using a particularly important structure that we will deal with for the rest of this lecture. So this is one of our gray slides where you have a chance to take a quick break and then we will continue. Having found this annoying aspect of probability theory, this combinatorial explosion of computational and memory cost, obviously we have to think of ways to simplify computations in the probabilistic setting. And we'll find one of the most important ones, of the most essential ones, now. To do so, I'm going to first introduce some new notation. So, actually, I'm not going to introduce a new notation, I'm going to change the way we use the notation. So, up until now, I've assumed that variables called A and B and C and so on are names of sets in the sigma algebra. So that means when I write a notation like a P of A, then this is supposed to represent the probability that this formula is true in the sense that the correct event within the elementary uh, set of events, of atomic events, is a part of this derived set in the sigma algebra A. And um, P of non-A meant that it was equal to 1 minus p of a by the derivations that we did in the previous lecture and that meant the probability that this statement is false so that the correct value lies in a part of the elementary set which is part of the complement of a in the sigma algebra. Now I'm going to make two changes now. The first one is actually quite simple. I'm just going to change um, what kind of values the, a's actually, the, the variables like a actually can take. So instead of talking about a formula, I'll talk about binary values. And I'll assume that A or B or C and so on, these variables are binary variables which take a truth value. So they are either true or false. They're either one or zero. This is a little bit confusing at first, which is why I didn't immediately do it, because it uses truth values for things that we assign probabilities to. But I'm sure you'll be able to manage. So I'm just gonna write, p of a equal to 1 as the same statement of, as above that the probability, uh, the, the probability for the formula a being true and I'll write p of a equal to 0 for the probability that a is false. Why am I doing that? Because it simplifies the notation quite significantly because we can now think of p as a function that maps from, a, from the space um, uh, that is that from, from, from the binary set of 0, 1 to the real numbers. Now, but I'm going to make another change in notation that is actually maybe more subtle. I'm going to assume that P is a function that is aware of the name of its input. So quite often in mathematical notation we write something like f of x and then x is just supposed to be a placeholder for some number and it doesn't actually matter that we've written f of x. We might as well write f of y and um, as long as y and x have the same value, that's the same number. Now, in the, the entire remainder of this course, I'm going to adopt a notation that's actually quite, well, it's sort of standard in uh, any literature using probabilities, which is that p of a and p of b are different things. So even if a and b have the same value, p of a and p of b are going to be separate. And in particular, um, that is going to allow me to write something like this statement, p of a and b, so the joint of a and b, the um, probability for the intersection of a and b. If I can write something like this is equal to p of a times p of b, then this, what I mean by this notation is that this function of two binary inputs, which corresponds to um, four possible values, right? Either a is one and b is one, or a is zero and b is one, or a is one and b is one, or a is zero and b is zero, that all of these four statements can be written in terms of two other probability distributions, 
which take a single binary input. So P of A equals 1 and B equals 1 can be written as using these other distributions over A and B as P of A equals 1 times P of B equals 1 and so on and so on. So in um, other parts of uh, mathematical analysis, it, it, being able to do something like this would require me to introduce new functions. So they had, would have to be a probability for A, maybe you have to, have to introduce a sub-index A over the var value var variables that A can take, 0 and 1, and then another function PB, which takes the inputs for B and um, can take two binary values. But this quickly becomes very tedious to do, uh, therefore we're going to do, use this introduction. You can actually, if, you're, if you have coding experience, you can think of this as um, functions that are aware of key words that get entered as their variables. So similar to the formalism in Python, for example. Why is this notation helpful? Well, one interesting thing we can now do is we can, so I've just mentioned that there's this problem with computational complexity in probabilistic reasoning. So we'll have to find structure in probability distributions that simplify reasoning, which allow us to do less than keep track of all the combinatorially many terms in our probability distributions. And one way to do so is to use a structure like this, which you could call a low rank structure. So this means that, for example, for two variables, this P of A and B, this joint, this is a matrix of size two by two, what this statement is saying is that we can write this matrix as the outer product of two vectors. And of course, these two vectors require potentially less entries than the elements of the matrix. This isn't true for a two by two matrix, but it's true for all matrices that are larger than two by two, right? Um, that's because two plus two and two times two are the same thing. Using this structure, we can define maybe the most important concept of uh, probabilistic reasoning, and that's independence. We're going to say that a probability distribution that has this structure, that it um, can be written as this product of two separate distributions, that this has the property of independence. So two variables, A and B, are, con are called independent random variables if and only if they are joint distributions, the distribution factorizes into so-called marginal distributions. That means we can write P of A and B in this form. And this string means what I just defined on the previous slide. In this case, as you can convince yourself of quite easily, um, using the definition of, conditional, of the conditional um, distribution, P of A given B actually equals P of A. I'm going to use a particular notation, which is not universal, but it's also going, only going to show up a few times over this course, which uses this symbol to say that, I can, that when this holds, then we write this. So this means A is independent of B. And one way to think about this intuitively is that information about B, if I tell you something about B, you cannot use this information to learn something new about A. And the reason for this is precisely this relationship. And vice versa, of course. There's a generalization of this, which is quite straightforward, to conditional distributions. So, as you, as you know from the previous lecture, prob conditional probability distributions are also probability distributions, so we might as well define the same concept for conditional distributions. So, um, ah, by the way, yeah, I, should, I, I didn't say that. So, of course, there's a, um, one, uh, to, to give you a simple example of independence, sorry, let's go back to independence for a moment. A very simple example is two coin tosses. Actually, that's your, every statistician's favorite example, right? So, if you have two coins, and you throw them separately, then um, the probability for each of them to uh, separately, well, the probability distribution for each of them is completely separate from each other, right? The probability for the first coin, let's call that A, to show heads, doesn't have anything to do with whether the second coin shows heads or tails. So that means we can write this 
uh, joint probability distribution over these two variables, A and B, let's call them A, 0, 1, and B. We can write that, let's say both coins have the same probability of 50% uh, to come heads, then the probability for both of these to come heads is a half times a half, for both of them to come tails is a half times a half, and so on. Now, of course, we can write this as the outer product of these two vectors, which are both a half and a half. Okay? Good. So that's easy. Um, and clearly, therefore, we can write this joint distribution as the product of two separate marginal distributions. Now, um, there's a generalization to this notion, which is conditional independence. So two variables, and that's a trivial extension, these two variables are going to be called conditionally independent, given a third variable, let's call it C, if and only if their conditional distribution factorizes. So if we can write the conditional distribution P of A and B given C as P of A given C times P of B given C. And everything else works as before. So in that case, the, um, uh, conditional distributions are, are, uh, um, are essentially the same. And, um, in, uh, in light of the information provided by C, learning about B doesn't provide further information about A, further to the information that C already provided. We're going to use a similar notation to say A is independent of B given C. So an example for this kind of situation would be a different setup where we again have our two coins but there's a third variable, and that third variable is actually a bell. So the experiment is going to be that um, someone, unbeknownst to you, throws two coins separate from each other. You cannot see what the outcome of these coin tosses is. And then they look at this setup, they see what comes up. And if both coins show the same side, if they are both heads or both tails, then this person rings a bell. And if they're not the same, so if one shows heads and the other shows tails, or the other way around, then um, there will be no bell ringing. The person will just go lift, lift the bell and put it back down again. So what this bell does is it provides information about the parity of these two coins. It tells you whether the two are the same or whether they are different. Now, let's think about this example for, for a second. So um, maybe we can write down a joint distribution for this. It's going to be now a little bit more complicated because we're not going to have to think about a matrix anymore, but about a three-dimensional object because we now have three variables. And that means our table is going to have eight entries, right? Because two to the three is eight. So um, maybe one way to do this is to write our joint distribution P of A, B, and C uh, by writing two of these two by two tables. So we're going to say either C is zero, and then we can write a table about A and B, and A might be either one, zero or one, zero or one. So if C is zero, then the two, so that means the bell did not ring, then the two um, coins have to be of different face. So there will have to be zeros in here, and the other two are just one half, of course. Um, or C is one, so there has to be a comma here in between. It's not a plus or so, it's really just more entries to the table. And then A can still be zero or one, and B can still be zero or one. And C equal to one means that the bell has rang. So we now know that these two coins have to have the same head, uh, the same face. So there's only two options for this. All right. Okay. So this is our joint probability table. So um, 
oh, I'm sorry, of course this should be quarters because all of this of course happens with a quarter probability, otherwise this wouldn't be a probability distribution. Okay, so now let's think about conditional independence in this kind of setting. So first of all, there is still a marginal independence. Of course, A and B are independent of each other. How do we see this? Well, we can actually, I mean, of course, that's just a generative process, right? That's actually what happens. You just throw two coins. But we can also check that this is true in our table of probabilities here by um, writing the marginal over A and B, which is by the sum rule, the probability for A, B, C equal to one, plus the probability for A, B, C equal to zero. So it's just a sum of these two tables. And as you can see, of course, this is just our old table back with all one quarter everywhere. So I don't even have to write that down. But now, what about conditional independence? So what about A and so, ah, actually, no, another example is marginal. <laughs> marginal uh, in, in independence for A and C. So this is a different kind of variable now, right? So C is the, is, is the, is the um, ringing of the bell. Now, before I write down the math, we can think about this. So you've just, let, let's say you just throw, you throw through one coin, A, and you saw heads, okay? Now, what's your prediction for whether the bell is going to ring or not? You don't know, right? Because you have no idea what the other coin is. So the probability is still 50-50 that the bell is going to ring. So that means this, your coin toss does not provide information about what the uh, va value of variable C is going to be. So therefore, it's independent. We can also check this by computing the uh, distribution for a and C, so P of A and C, is of course, by the same rule, the sum of P of um, A, C and B is equal to one, plus P of A, C, B equal to zero. By the way, notice I've just made use of this property of this notation that all the variables have names. So we can even change their order and nothing is, going to, nothing is going to be affected because this function P is aware of where all the A's and B's and C's are in our notation. So what is this? Well, we can first write down a distribution over A and C for um, B equal to zero. So sorry, B equal to one. So if B is one, then we could write a table over A and C. And this means, so if A is zero, but B is one, then C has to be zero. It can't be one, right? Because the bell is not going to ring if A and B have different values. So the entry will have to be here. And of course, the probability for this is one quarter because what we're, see, what we're doing here is we're just selecting numbers from this table up here. You can't get any other number than one quarter, right? So there has to be a zero here. And now you can convince yourself that this works in the other direction as well. We just get zero, one quarter, one quarter, zero. And our table is again, this full table of all one quarters everywhere. And of course, that's independent. Now let's get to some points where conditional independence becomes a little bit more interesting and we actually talk about conditional independence. So let's say, um, well, okay, so B is also independent uh, of, of C, but we don't have to do that because it's totally symmetric, right? You just replace the names of A and B here. Now let's talk about A and B given C. So of course, intuitively, if I tell you what um, if you observe the ringing of the bell, then that provides information about the other coin. So I throw my coin, I see that it heads, that it's heads, the other person throws their coin, I don't see the other coin, but the person watching both of them is ringing the bell, then I know what the other coin is, right? I know that it's also heads. So the bell actually provides information for um, what this uh, structure looks like. So I need some space on my whiteboard. Just a moment, uh, let me get rid of this. So 
So now um, we want to talk about P of A and B given C to check whether it can be factorized. So we need P of A and B given C. Now, how do we write that down? Well, okay, so we've just already spoken about it intuitively, but we want to use math to get this right. So we have to use Bayes' theorem to write, um, or actually just the definition of a conditional distribution, because we can, we can, simplify, uh, we can simply compute the normalization constant, the evidence. So we need P of um, A and B for C equal to something. So let's say P of A and B given that the bell rang. But of course, we could equally use the fact uh, the setting if the bell didn't ring, because conditional independence means that this holds for all terms, not just for one of them. So if we find one example where um, the where we can not separate the table into rank one terms, then we're done. So um, we have to normalize by p of c. I hope you you have convinced yourself that that's the case equal to 1. Now notice that the probability for uh, c to be 1, so for the bell to ring, we can read off by summing over this part of the table, that's 1 half. So what this is going to be is 1 uh, divided by 1 half, so multiplied by 2, the probability for a and b given that c is 1. And this is this table up here. So it's just this thing, right? 1 quarter, one quarter, zero, zero. So this is one half and one half. So this table, clearly, because it's a diagonal table, cannot be written as the outer product of two rank one terms. So A and B are dependent on each other when conditioned on C. The, the, the observation of the bell ringing gives us information about the value of the other coin. So what about, maybe just to conclude this thought, A and C given b. Let's say b is equal to 1. So this is now the situation where I throw my coin and then the um, other person, so I should maybe actually write this like this at first, right? So I have my coin, I call that b, okay? Um, and um, I now um, uh, uh, throw it, I see that it's heads, and now I have to predict both the coin tossing and the other coin. Now, of course, I have to predict that both of them jointly. If I first predict what the other coin is, then I'm forced to assign a certain value to, uh, to the coin. Uh, to, the, to the bell, right, or to the other variable. Right? So if I um, have thrown my coin and I've seen that it's, uh, that it's a heads and the, uh, I've observed the person ringing the bell, then I know what the value of the other coin is. So let's see if this is true. We, so that means they are conditionally dependent on each other. So we just use Bayes' theorem again. That's P of A and C, given that B is equal to 1. Um, not given that, and b being equal to 1, divided by p of b, b, the probability for p of b given 1. So this probability is again 50%, 1 half, so it's 2 times, and now we need a new table that is a table between a and c. And what is that table? Well, so if a is 0, then the coin mustn't ring. So um, we get the probability one quarter in here. If a is zero and uh, so, so like this, and if a is one and b is one, then the, coin, then the bell has to ring, so we get our one zero here. You can also look, check for yourself that these entries are actually the corresponding one that I've picked from this joint table up here, because of course this defines everything further down. And again, this is the same table, so we see that it doesn't factorize. So we're going to use this concept of independence or conditional independence to simplify computations further down. 
So, so far, you haven't actually seen any reduction of computational complexity at all because we've been talking about two by two matrices. And a uh, two by two matrix, when written as the outer product of two two by one vectors, actually contains the same numbers on either side, right? The same amount of numbers. We always need four numbers. But things get more complicated when we have um, uh, more, more than two variables. And also, of course, if the variables can, can take on more than binary values to which will come next week. So this was the second section of the lecture. Um, we've introduced a concept which in the most general form we can call conditionally independence, conditional independence. Two variables A and B are called conditionally independent given a variable C if and only if their conditional distribution factorizes. And a special case of this is just independence, or you might call it marginal independence. So two variables A and B are called independent if and only if their distribution factorizes. By the way, if you want to check for yourself whether you fully understood this example with the coin and the bell, then try to think about the situation in, where, in which one of these coins is not fair. So let's say the second coin has probability one quarter of coming up heads and three quarters of coming up tails. Think for yourself whether the conditional independence that we've just constructed then still holds. Now that we have defined the notion of independence and conditional, indep and conditional independence, we can now try and see how we can use this concept and how it can help us to reduce the computational cost of inference under uncertainty. And to do so, we'll use an example that uh, goes back to a wonderful book by Judea Pearl, written in 1988. It's called Probabilistic Reasoning in Intelligence Systems, and it was picked up by David McKay in his book, Information Theory, Inference, and Learning Algorithms, which was published a little bit later. Both of these books, by the way, really great, even though you don't have to read them to follow this course. I've actually tried to come up with a better example, one that is more recent, maybe one that's motivated by current uh, social societal situations. But actually, it turns out this ex example is so well crafted and the numbers work out so nicely that this is actually the perfect experiment to make and I'm not, or example to make, and I'm not going to change it at all. It's based on the following story. So there's this guy, let's call him Fred. He lives in downtown Oakland in the Bay Area in California. There's two th important things to know about Oakland. One is that it's a high crime area, at least it was in 1988. And the other one is that because it's in the Bay Area, there are regular um, earthquakes in this region. So let's say Fred drives to work in the Silicon Valley every day. So he sits in his car for quite a long time to get from one side of the bay to the other. And uh, because he's worried about break-ins in his house, he's had break-ins before, he has an alarm at home. Now he's sitting at work and he gets a phone call from his neighbor telling him that his alarm just went off. So he's worried, of course, that again, someone has been uh, br uh, breaking into his house. So he gets out, out of work, jumps into his car, starts driving towards home. Because it's quite a drive, he switches on the radio and now he hears on the radio an announcement that um, there has just been a small minor earthquake that hit Oakland. So now, as a rational man, Fred is relieved because he thinks to himself, ah, of course, this must have been the source of the alarm. There was this small earthquake and it tri triggered my alarm. Now, this kind of reasoning process is typical for the way humans think about their daily lives. And let's see how a machine can reproduce this kind of process if it uses the calculus of uncertainty probability theory. And to do so, we will follow a basic cooking recipe that applies to all such problems. And it starts with creating all the ingredients we need for probabilistic reasoning, which we already outlined in the previous lecture. So first of all, we have to create our sigma algebra. We have to create the set of variables with which we're going to be reasoning. And in this, in this exercise or example, there are four of these. 
there's the variable which we'll call a. It's a binary variable that uh, says whether the alarm at Fred's home has been triggered or not. Then there's the variable e, which stands for earthquake, and is another binary variable that says whether there is an earthquake or not. And there's a variable which we'll call b, um, which indicates, again, in a binary fashion, whether there has been a break-in into his house or not. And finally, a variable r, which indicates that there has been an announcement made on the radio. Now notice that some of these variables, similar to the experiment with the cards we did at the beginning of the first lecture, are latent in the sense that we do not know them, or at least Fred in his current state of mind doesn't know their value, while others are observable. At first, we get information that the alarm is on, and then later on we get information that there is also an earthquake. Now, the second ingredient we need, uh, once we've written down our, um, our sigma algebra, is the function p that shows up in the definition of a probability space. So we now already have elementary events and a sigma algebra. Um, so the elementary, events are, uh, the elementary events are those four and all of their possible combinations, basically. And um, the sigma algebra is all possible combinations of, of these kind of statements. Now we, um, or sets of subsets, now we need a, a probability function. So we need to assign a probability to all possible states of these four binary variables. Now we could do so really by just creating a table for these four binary variables. So that table will have 16 entries, two to the four, only one of which is fixed by the fact that all these probabilities have to sum to one. So there are 15 degrees of freedom. And then we can create this table in any way we want. So basically we can start with any variable that we care about, write it on, on, on the right hand side, and then create conditional distributions for additional variables given everything we've already created until we have spanned all of the variables. That's what the product will tell us to do. However, sometimes, and this is where conditional independence becomes important, we might get lucky and there might be some additional information that we have available when designing the process or when like, using domain knowledge about the problem that can simplify the computation. So let's look at these terms here. The probability for the alarm to go off obviously only depends on whether there's been an earthquake or a burglary because the radio announcer doesn't care about Fred's alarm. So this R can be dropped. And instead of this complicated term, which is a table with eight degrees of freedom, we actually get only four degrees of freedom. By the way, why is it eight degrees of freedom? Well, because there are three variables here <clears throat> and two to the three is eight. And we need all three possible, uh, sorry, all eight possible values. We need to enumerate these. And then for every single one of these configurations, we have to write down what the probability for an alarm is. We don't need to write down what the probability for not an alarm is because that's just one minus the probability for an alarm. So there are eight degrees of freedom here, four, two, and one. But actually we don't need this R. We know that this statement is independent of R. So therefore, we actually only need to uh, enumerate four possible states to get this term. The probability for the radio announcement also doesn't depend on whether there's been a burglary or not, again, because the radio announcer doesn't care about Fred's home. So here, instead of four parameters, we only need two. And an earthquake is not triggered by the burglar, so therefore, we can drop the B here and are left with a simple um, essentially just one parameter or just one parameter probability for an earthquake because the probability for not an earthquake is just one minus that probability. Okay, that's one way in which independence can drastically help us simplify computation. Instead of having to write down 15 different real numbers, we now only have to write down eight. That's almost half the degrees of freedom and all we've done is use domain knowledge. Now, the final part of our cooking recipe is going to be the computation. Before we get to that, we can um, create a little bit of a graphical representation of what we've just been doing. The, at the moment, this is just a nice little picture. I'll come back to it in a, in a few minutes and tell you that this is actually a formal framework to create such pictures. But it's actually best to start this thought process just by looking at this nice picture. What we've done here is, is create a kind of a visualization of what's actually going on here by writing down all of these four variables, each of them in a circle. And then I did two things. The first thing is I drew arrows between these variables. And I did this in, in the following formal way. 
for every term in this factorization up here, I drew an arrow from, or arrows, from all of the variables on the right-hand side to all of the variables on the left-hand side. So here there's two arrows from E and B to A, and one arrow from E to R, and no arrows into E and B, because there is nothing on the right-hand side. And then the other thing I did is, I um, colored in, in a dark color, variables that Fred gets to see. Not at the same time, one after the other, but eventually he'll get to see them. And I've left empty latent variables, variables for which Fred doesn't have uh, a direct access. Now that we have this picture, we can now do inference. And the beautiful thing about probabilistic reasoning is that the inference part is totally mechanical. We just have to write down numbers and use Bayes' theorem to compute posteriors. So let's start with some numbers. We um, need to actually say how likely everything is, not just provide um, variables. So let's, just for the sake of argument, assume that the probability um, for a burglary in Fred's home is about uh, 10 to the minus 3 per day. So that means once every three years his house is broken into. Um, of course, the probability for not a burglary is just 1 minus that. The probability for an earthquake, to keep things, things simple, might also be 10 to the minus 3. So that's again an earthquake every three years. And the probability for not an earthquake, of course, is just 1 minus that number. Now, let's assume the radio announcer is faithful. So uh, this person only talks about earthquakes when there is actually one. And they don't talk about earthquakes when there is no earthquake. That's very simple. Um, this, of course, is going to drastically simplify the computation. We basically don't have to worry about R anymore because R is now just identical to E. And the most complicated part of our computation is this conditional probability table for the alarm to go off, depending on whether there is or isn't an earthquake and or a burglary. This is a bit of a combinatorial problem. Combinatorics are, can be quite tedious. So um, let me simplify this for you by just going through the reasoning process for you. It's not actually something that you have to totally uh, be excited about. We just need to get some numbers. So I'll introduce three variables. F is the probability for a false alarm. So that means every now and then uh, alarms, burglary alarms just go off without much reason. Not because of an earthquake or a burglary, they just go off. And let's say that happens also once every three years. Just to keep things simple, 10 to the minus 3. And then we need a probability for the alarm to go off if there is actually a burglary. Let's say this is a very reliable alarm, so it goes off in 99.9% .9 of the cases where there is actually a burglary. And finally, we need a probability for the um, alarm to, um, to go off if there is uh, an earthquake, and that's probably hopefully going to be a small number because earthquakes happen, uh, well, sorry, no, because um, alarms shouldn't all go off when there's a, a small earthquake. So let's say if there's a small earthquake, every one in a thousand alarms actually go off. So that would be um, um, an, a probability for an alarm of 0.001, given that there is an earthquake. With these three, let's say, generating variables, we can now populate this conditional probability table. So what's, and we can do this quite quickly, it's just plugging in numbers. What's the probability for the alarm not to go off? Well, actually, it's easier to write down what's the probability for the alarm to go off if there is no burglary and no earthquake. That's what we just defined. It's this probability f, this small probability, once every three years. What's the probability for there, no, to, for there to be no alarm in this case? Then we just take 1 minus that probability. Right? This actually quite simplifies the, uh, these computations. We always just look for the case that is easier to write down and then take the opposite as just 1 minus that probability. For the other three cases, it's actually easier to think about how no alarm can, co can come about. So how could it be that there is no alarm if there is a burglary and there is no earthquake? Well, the probability for that is, first of all, that there is no false alarm, because we don't see an alarm. And there is a burglary, but the alarm didn't go off. So that's 1 minus alpha b. And vice versa for the probability for the alarm to go off. So that's actually a kind of complicated number, even though it sounds so simple. 
What's the probability for no alarm given an earthquake but no burglary? That's the same as before but now with alpha E rather than alpha B. I actually recommend that you have a look at this afterwards yourself to understand where these numbers come from. It's sometimes easier to just wrap your head around this if you've actually looked at it a bit for yourself. And what's the probability for no alarm given that there is a burglary and an earthquake simultaneously? Well, the probability for there to be no alarm is that there is no false alarm despite the burglary, no alarm, and despite the earthquake, no alarm. And the probability for the alarm, given both, is just 1 minus that probability. Um, we can also compute the actual numbers for that, so here I've done this for you. That's obviously trivial arithmetic, so let's just uh, save ourselves this. Just a bunch of numbers, some, some very large, some very small. And now let's um, actually get into doing some inference. So the our first question one could have is, what's the probability that, oops, I'm sorry, what's the probability that um, there was something concerning, either an earthquake or a break-in, given that the alarm just went off? So this is now just Bayes' theorem. We plug in the probability for the alarm to go off, given um, uh, earthquake and burglary, and for that we haven't actually said yet whether we want b or e to be e equal to 1 or 0, we can just plug in numbers later and um, multiply this with the probability for burglary and earthquake and normalize by the evidence. The most complicated term in this expression is actually the evidence, the probability for there to be an alarm. To get this, we just uh, sum up lots and lots of numbers that we can all find on a previous slide. Just multiply them together and get out a probability of about 0.2% for an alarm in any given day. And um, use this to compute the posterior probabilities for burglaries and alarms. So here are all four of them. Probability given, al given an alarm for no burglary, no earthquake, burglary and earthquake, burglary but no earthquake, and burglary and earthquake. Now um, we see that the probability for nothing to happen is about 50% and the probability for a burglary and no earthquake is also about 50%. One interesting thing to note about this is, well actually let's first look at what's the probability for a burglary in the first place. Well to get this we have to get rid of the earthquake and how do we get rid of variables? We use the sum rule. So by summing out the two cases where there is no burglary and either an earthquake or not, we get a probability of about 50, just over 50% for a burglary, for no burglary, and just under 50% for a burglary. So that's maybe enough concern to get into your car and drive back home. Another interesting aspect of this computation is that if you look at this probability table, that's the probability for um, the conditional probability given an alarm for earthquakes and burglaries. Notice that this table is not independent anymore. So although the model initially assumed that burglaries and earthquakes happen independent of each other, after we observe the alarm, we actually now have a conditional dependence between these variables. This is an interesting kind of effect. Once you observe a variable that can be caused by two different causes or generative processes, the uh, two possible generators actually become correlated with each other. They now depend on each other. So, um, how is that, like what kind of effect is that going to have? Well, we see that if we now go forward and ask, once we get the additional information via the radio, that there is actually an, an earthquake, uh, so what is then the probability for a break-in, given that there was an alarm and a radio announcement? Well, um, for that, we just compute the probability for a burglary given that there is an earthquake. How do we do that? Well, we use again Bayes' theorem, which tells us to compute this conditional by taking a joint and dividing by the um, marginal or the evidence. And actually, we can do that by taking these joint probabilities that we just computed on the previous slide and just computing, recomputing the normalization constant, which is also two numbers that we have on the previous slide. And that gives us a probability of 92% that there is no burglary and 8% that there is a burglary. So this is an interesting effect that is called explaining away. Initially, we got the observation that there is uh, an alarm, which could have come from essentially two different sources, either an earthquake or a burglary. Once we are informed that there is an earthquake, our posterior probability for the, uh, for the burglary actually goes down. 
And this, of course, is in line with everyday reasoning, right? Your concern drops once you found that another explanation you were also concerned about is actually the right one. Now, notice that this is not the same as saying, or I'm not saying that after we, know, we hear about the earthquake, we're now less concerned about the alarm than we were before we got, so, sorry, that we're now less concerned about the burglary than we were bef before we heard about the alarm. Actually, the posterior probability for the break-in is still significantly higher than it was a priori. It's just that this other explanation is so much more likely, now that we know that it's actually true, that the only remaining hypothesis to get this is that there was a burglary and an alarm at the same time, independent of each other, which is quite unlikely, even though it's actually still more likely than um, the break-in was before we heard about the alarm. So this example didn't just serve to show structure in um, our reasoning process. It also served to show you, give you a, a simple case example of the cooking recipe for solving inference problems that we're going to follow all through term. And this boils down, if you like, to a very concise sentence um, due to the wonderful David Mackay, which is that to do inference, you always should write down the probability of everything. That means you first define the, what you might call the sigma algebra, the set of all relevant variables. Then you define a joint probability that's assigning a probability measure to the sigma algebra on top to create a probability space. This is also known as writing down a generative model in practice. Once we have the probability space, we now are concerned with where our observations come from. So doing, getting observations fixes certain variables to certain, certain values. And then inference is an entirely mechanical process applying Bayes' theorem. This is the key conceptual strength of probability of probabilistic reasoning that once you have agreed on a generative model, there is basically no question anymore about what the correct answers to inference should be. Now, if you remember how easy it was, how fundamentally clean it was to write down a sigma algebra, at least on mathematical uh, grounds, this should be uh, really exciting news to you because it breaks down this suppo supposedly complicated process of reasoning in, under uncertainty into a purely mathematical process that then ends with a simple mechanical step. Now, of course, in practice, there are two different um, challenges here. The first one is a conceptual philosophical one. People argue a lot about their sigma algebras, and we will do that together over the entire term. And then there's a computational one, which is that it's easy to say, just apply Bayes' theorem. With, as we just noticed, that can be a combinatorially hard problem. So to solve these inference problems, we have to rely on all sorts of computational simplifications, approximations, and models. And sometimes the computational concerns will enter our modeling decisions. Actually, they will do that all the time. So we will have to think about this for the rest of term. Now, this isn't a gray slide, but you can still treat it like one and take a quick break. Now, for the final part of this lecture, I would like to return to these pretty pictures that I just happened to draw into one of our slides. Those turn out to not just be a pretty picture, they're actually a mathematical formalism that is surprisingly helpful, and we will be using it across the rest of term to um, deal with this very important issue of conditional independence. So these, these pictures I showed you with circles and arrows, these are called graphical models. And you might have heard about this concept before. Here is a first definition of what I mean by such a model, which is called, more specifically, a Bayesian network or a directed graphical model. Directed graphical models are um, a visualization of a probability distribution over variables, which give, let's give them name, that can be written as a factorization. So the joint probability distribution over the variables from 1 to d can be written as a product over a bunch of terms where each variable in the graph depends on a certain set of other variables, which we will call the parent nodes of that graph, or parental variables. That means that um, xi is not as an a, a member of the parental set of any of the variables that are in its own parental sets. That's why the word parents make sense, because if 
um, you have a set of four forebears, then you're certainly not a part of the forebears of any of your forebears. A directed graphical mo model can be represented by these pictures that I showed you, these directed acyclic graphs, where the propositional variables are nodes and the arrows point from parents to children. So we saw an example of this with this uh, radio earthquake alarm situation. And um, let's go back to this example and observe an interesting property which of graphical models or directed graphs. I will quite often say graphical models and then usually I mean directed graph. If I don't mean a directed graphical model, we'll, there are other var variants of directed graphs which we will get to later in the course, then I will explicitly say so. So um, one interesting aspect of these directed as, uh, um, graphical models or DAGs, directed acyclic graphs, is that any probability distribution over a set of variables can actually be written as such a graphical model. So um, that's tr why is this true? It's true because of the product rule. So we can take any joint probability distribution and just decide to use the, pro the product rule to, con uh, to write it as a factorization like this. Now in general though, this means that there are arrows pointing um, or, or connecting all variables with all other variables. That means there are uh, sort of quadratically many um, arrows in here and they are pointing from every possible variable to every other possible variable. That of course also means that you can change the order of these arrows around. So you can just decide to do the factorization in some other way and then the arrows point in the other direction or in potentially into other directions, it's still a directed acyclic graph and it's still fully connected. Now this, however, is not a useful use of directed graphs. So of course not, because it applies to every probability distribution. What is interesting is that every now and then we might be able to find factorizations such as the one we just used, where the graph contains way less arrows and that will then simplify inference for us. So notice to do the inference in the previous model, we only really had to write down these eight possible probabilities for the uh, for earthquake and sorry, for the alarm to go off if there is an earthquake and or a burglary. That was all it took. And then we were essentially done and could do inference. If we would have had to do this for, and actually only, this only had four degrees of freedom, right? To be clear. So if we wanted to do this for the fully connected graph, we would have had to write down 15 different variables rather than eight. So um, now you might ask, okay, that's nice, that's a pretty picture, but, and, and I understand how to generate these graphs, but how do you actually read off conditional independence from these kind of graphs? So how do you know which variable or which conditional probability table to actually write down once you've seen the graph? Well, it turns out that this is actually not an entirely trivial process. However, we can often look at local structure of these graphs to identify interesting conditional independent structure. And to do so, we um, can look at um, individual elementary graphs. So we'll do that now. That's going to be essentially the rest of what we do in, in uh, today's lecture. So let's take, so if, if you have three variables, then that's maybe the most atomic graph you have. But if you have two variables, then either they are disconnected, so then they're fully independent, or they are connected, and then they're fully dependent on each other, and the graph cannot actually show us anymore. If you have three variables, things get a bit more interesting, because we can now have three kinds of atomic graphs. Actually, there's a fourth one, where one of the variables, at least, is disconnected from the other, and then we're just reduced to the case of two variables. These three atomic graphs are um, the graph where arrows point from uh, the left to the right, always in the same direction. This is known as a chain graph. It's the graph where the arrows point um, from one variable to the two other ones. Um, this, um, well, actually there are different names for these, for these uh, subgraphs. You might call this a fan out if you like. And then there's another graph where uh, the arrows point inwards towards one joint variable, one common variable. Let's um, call this a, a collider. It's sometimes also called a V structure, but V is a bit dangerous because of course you can, if you move the B down here, then this looks like a V as well, but uh, the arrows are just pointing in another direction. 
So what are the conditional independent structures of these graphs? Well, let's go through them one by one. I've actually already given you the answers, but let's see if we can reconstruct them um, on the board. So what's the conditional independence for, uh, for a chain? So let me just draw this on the, on the blackboard. For the situation A, B, C, um, we, what, what this graph implies is the factorization that you see on the right, so that the joint can be written as P of C given B times P of B given A times P of A. I'll write that down because otherwise it's going to be awkward in the, in the video. A, B, C is P of C given B, P of um, B given A times P of A. If you don't know why you can read this off from the graph, go back and have a look at how we define these directed acyclic graphs. Now, um, what does that mean for the um, probability for, let's say, let's first think about something that might be independent of each other, conditionally, for um, P of A and C given B. Well, we can do this by just writing down Bayes' theorem, right? So that's P of the joint A, B, C divided by the normalization constant. So that's P of B. What is P of B? Well, it's the sum over all possible values of A and C. And I'll just write that like this. Or you could write it as two sums. Let's put it like this. A and C times P of um, what is the factorization down here? C given B, P of B given A times P of A. Now you might notice that we can rearrange this sum, and let me see if I can do this so that you can see it on the video, into, by plugging in this factorization above, into a term that only depends on C and B. So we get P of um, C given B divided by, now the important part is this sum down here. Notice that C only shows up in this one term and not in these two. So therefore, we can, and let me get rid of this glare, like this. So therefore, we can um, take this sum outside of the sum over A, and we get a sum over all values of C, P of C given B, times, and let's already put a record around that, times an expression P of B given A, times P of A, divided by the sum over exactly this, over all possible values of A, P given A, times P of A. By the way, notice that I'm misusing notation here a little bit. I'm just saying sum over A. What I mean by that is it's a sum over all possible values of A. In our notation so far, these variables are binary, so it's a sum over A equal to 0 or A equal to 1. From next lecture onwards, we will consider other general more possible values for variables like this. But this factorization property will actually also carry through because it doesn't really matter what that sum is over. A only shows up in this right-hand side, C only in this left-hand side. So now we've written this as a probability over C times a probability over B. So given B, A and C become independent in this graph. That's an in interesting property, which we're actually going to make very fundamental use of in, for a significant part of the lecture. You can already imagine why this might be useful. It might be useful because these kind of processes are time structure processes that go over time in time series. Now, um, what about P of um, A and C without B? Now, just look at this expression again. If we don't condition on C, so if we only um, want to get rid of B, then I'm not even going to write this down. We can look at the joint. Now imagine you wanted to sum out B here using the sum rule to get a marginal distribution over just A and C, then you can't do this in general because there is a term that depends on B in both the term that depends on C and the term that depends on A. So here are some bits on A and some bits on C. If I write a sum over B in here, then there is no general way, as assuming no, no further specific structure on, the, on, on this joint, for these to be independent of each other. 
Okay, so in chain graphs, we now know that conditioning on the thing in the middle, the variable b, the local kind of current state, if you like, disconnects, like makes conditionally independent, the left and the right hand side of the chain. Let's look at the other expression, the, um, uh, sorry, the next graph, which is this fan out type of structure. So that's um, a joint distribution over A, B, and C such that um, that joint is given by A given B and C given B times P of B. What is the conditional independent structure of this? Let me write this down again. B, A, C. So maybe just to point out along the side, this where we put the notes doesn't really matter. We just do it so that it has such that it's visually pleasing. Sometimes it's, it's a good idea to move up and down. We can also put them all in one line. It's just easier so to see the structure. Also, these arrows have nothing in general to do with causality. They're just to observe um, conditional independence. We talk about generative processes, but not about causal processes, to be precise. Nevertheless, of course, in many cases, causality will play an intricate role. And actually, the fact that causality is weakly connected with generative processes is one of the key challenges to get causality right, because people constantly confuse the two. So this joint distribution, which I will write as P of A, B, C, is equal to P of A given B, B of B, P of C given B. For that we can ask, again, what is the conditional independence or dependence of A and C? So let's think again about our joint distribution over A and C given B. For that we will notice, so we can write down again the joint. So this is a Bayes theorem, is, tells us to compute this by writing down the joint distribution, which is this, P of A given B, P of B, P of C given B, and divide it by the double sum over this expression over A and C. And we can actually already do that, like just by looking at this, notice that this will give us one sum over A, which only depends on A given B, times P of B, but B doesn't actually depend on A, right? And then there is another sum over C, P of C given B. And you can maybe even already see now that P of B will just cancel out, which is good because we are conditioning on B. So this part just goes and we're left with just two normalized probability distributions for A given B and for C given B. They're obviously independent of each other. But in general, if you look at this joint distribution, so without a denominator or just the expression up here, if we um, wanted to, maybe you can't even see that. We'll find this later on, then I'll do something about the picture. So if we um, instead, okay, let me just write this down here. Ah, I'll, I'll, I'll vote it down here, right? So if, if we wanted to sum out B from this expression, then B will show up both in the term in A and the term in C. And we won't be able to get two separate terms that only depend on A and only on C uh, in a factorized way. So again, in these fan out structures, A is in general not independent of C, but it becomes independent of C once conditioned on B. Again, the intuition that sort of forces itself onto you is that you can think of this as a generative causal kind of um, a situation where B causes A and C. And then if you know the cause, then A and C differ only in some kind of noise process that is local to them. So therefore, they are conditionally independent once you know the cause. If you don't know the cause, then of course they depend on each other because they are connected by the cause. Now again, it's dangerous to think this way because these graphs are not in their construction directly connected to causality. The way we draw these arrows is solely based on a mathematical property of the generative process that it factorizes in a certain way, it's not necessarily motivated by causality. In many cases, it will be because of cause causal structure, but it doesn't have to be because of causal structure. Now, the final graph we can talk about is this uh, collider type structure where two parents, A and C, 
affect B um, and create B. So let's draw this again. And you notice how the language I used, how, they, how they, the parents affect the children and so on, already suggests causality again. This is exactly going to be the problem we'll have to deal with when we talk about causality. So let's talk about this graph. Finally, then um, this is this joint is given by P of B given A and C and then the two separate ancestral terms. So in this expression, we see just by looking at it that obviously the marginal of A and C is going to be independent of each other. Why? Because there's only one term here in B which you can just, just sum out as a probability distribution and A and C do not show up in that sum so we can take it outside of the sum and this term just drops. Evidently they are independent of each other. But when we condition on B, we now get a, um, a term that complicates things. So we can just write again, it's always the same kind of, by now you should probably be able to do this proof in your head, right? So the probability of A and C given B is now just this joint. So that's P of B, A, C, P of A, P of B, divided by a sum over A and C, P of B given A, C, P of A, P of B. And the annoying bit is this term here, which um, forces us to consider A and, A and C jointly in, that's of course wrong, that should be a C, jointly in uh, this computation, because A and C both show up in this term. So when we sum them out, there will just be one term that has to be considered together. Okay, so these atomic structures sometimes allow us to just read off conditional independence from our graphs. So here is our um, earthquake, alarm, burglary, and radio situation again. Um, what, what can we read off from this graph? Well, actually, maybe you want to stop the, the video here for a second and think about this yourself. Once you've done so, I can tell you what, what we can read off. So, for example, we can see that... Um, the radio announcement becomes conditionally independent of the alarm once we hear about the earthquake. Why? Because um, if you look at this kind of subgraph, so first of all, why can we think of a subgraph? Well, you could think of the variables A and B as a joint variable, actually, so as a, as a set of two variables, A and B. And um, actually, for this kind of problem, we can even think about um, um, them jointly and not even try to, to get rid of them in the first place. But um, so, uh, because then we can still make this statement, right? So notice that then what remains is one of these fan out type structures. So we can read off that when we condition on the parent, the children become independent of each other, even if we call that child A and B rather than just A. They're still independent, right? But in general, if we sum out E, then this line up here will tell us that they become dependent on, the, on uh, in, well, they are in general not independent of each other, so they are dependent on each other. Why is that? Well, if you don't know yet whether your alarm has been raised by a burglar or an earthquake, then you don't know, you, you um, have to, your, your pro posterior probability for a radio announcement actually goes up, right? You hear about the alarm, one possible explanation for that is, a, is an earthquake, if there is an earthquake, there will be a radio announcement. So if, you just, so if someone calls you on the phone and tells you that your alarm just went off, your posterior probability for a radio announcement about an earthquake has just risen as well. But there are other um, conditional independence structures that we can't directly, trivially read off just from staring at the graph and trying to find substructure in here. They um, can still be found if you think a little bit longer about them for example, by writing down the entire joint and laboriously trying to find conditional independence, or also by, again, introducing sets of variables that are jointly considered, and then looking a little bit more closely into the subsets, whether they can be ch taken out or not. In the interest of time, I'll not do that and leave that to you as an exercise. It's also interesting to, to, to point out a final aspect and maybe a bit of a flaw of these directed graphical models 
by looking again at our case of two coins and a bell. So that was the situation we spoke about earlier today, which is that two, there are two coins that are being thrown, um, which we might or might not observe, parts of which, and then there is a third process, C, which is a bell that rings whenever the two coins share parity. So if they're both heads or if they're both tails. Now, um, these conditional independence tables, and you can do this for yourself, actually imply various different conditional independences. And, well, we've already spoken about this uh, um, earlier in the lecture, right? So, um, A is independent of B, B is independent of C, C is independent of A, and C is independent of B. Now, unfortunately, there is no single um, directed graph which can represent all of these conditional, uh, conditional or general independences. So if we take each of these four um, individual lines, then we can write them, we can generate um, these different kind of factorizations from, these, uh, from, from this table. So we could either think of C as being the child that is generated by the two, by the two coins, by the two parents, uh, actually it's up here, or we can think of um, one of the coins as the child of the other coin and the bell, or we can think of one of, of, of the other coin as the child of the bell and the, and the other coin. So notice how this is where causality breaks down. I've, dis I've described the situation to you as someone throws two coins, then looks at them, then rings the bell. But of course, these, just this conditional independence structure can, um, uh, doesn't encode this causal kind of structure. It could also be described as you ring, you throw one coin, then you randomly decide whether you're going to ring the bell or not. And if the bell rings, then you put the other coin to show the same face as the first coin, otherwise you turn it around. That's not the causal process we, we, we imagine, but it's the same, it in, implies the same conditional probability table and therefore the same conditional independence structure. Now, if you look at these three expressions, they correspond to three different graphs that you can write down and I hope that you will, will convince, be able to convince yourself that these three correspond to these three graphs. And each of these graphs has um, only encodes um, the conditional independences that are encoded in these three representations. But, and I'll leave that to yourself to convince you, any single one of these graphs does not encode all of the conditional independences that we have up here. So a problem with directed acyclic graphs or, gener or uh, sorry, Bayesian networks, so directed graphical models to represent conditional independence structure is that they are an incomplete language in the sense that any, part, any unique single directed acyclic graph can encode only a certain number of conditional independence structures and there are um, joint probability distributions for which it's impossible to encode all conditional independence structure in one directed graph in one go. Now, that's a problem and you might ask yourself how to fix that if you can find a general solution, you're very much invited to write a wonderful paper about it um, because it's essentially an unsolved problem. However, before you do so, maybe wait till the end of the term because there's a much, much more complicated story to these graphs that we will talk about um, over the course of this term. So now I just have to get rid of this stupid thing. And finally, show you our final slide. Um, thanks for taking part in the lecture. This second lecture was um, about the notion of independence. We saw that probability theory, even though it's a beautiful mechanical process, has a computational issue, which is that if we keep track of uncertainty about several possible hypotheses, then we might potentially fa face a combinatorially hard problem. This is a fundamental part of reasoning under uncertainty. It's not solved by any other framework. It's just caused by the fact that we want to keep track of several possible hypotheses. We will find many different ways of dealing with this computationally. One very important one is the notion of conditional independence, which reduces complexity and helps us make things tractable by essentially separating sums from each other so that they can be solved 
with way less degrees of freedom um, because combinatorial complexi complexity drops out. We will think much more about this over the course of this talk. We also found directed graphical models as a notion um, to encode these uh, generative processes. They provide a language that allows us to encode certain kinds of conditional independence visually. That's much easier to read off from a picture than it is from a factorization of a probability distribution. They are wonderful tools. They are quite formal, but they also have some flaws. One of them is that it's not entirely trivial to read off conditional independence. And the other one is that they are not able to encode, in general, all conditional independence structure of any particular joint probability distribution in just one graph. We will return to them later in the course and they will show up as a pictorial view along the side of the, of the slides over and over again. Now, conditional independence is primarily going to be a computational tool for us that simplifies computational tasks in machine learning and we will make lots of use of it throughout this course. But I want to leave you as we end this second lecture with a philosophical thought to take with you as um, you ponder this, uh, this lecture, which is that it is actually the very nature of independence that is the biggest philosophical issue maybe for probability theory. Not the prior and the likelihood and what it means to be uncertain, but actually what it means to be independent. Kolmogorov in his original paper or book in 1933 already points out very early on actually that independence is really the key challenge to define what probability or how to use probabilities correctly. And so here is the original text. He actually says we thus realize that um, in the uh, the, in, in the notion of independence, the real core of the unique prob prob problematic aspects of uh, probabil probabilistic reasoning or computation with probabilities. It's not the definition of probabilities as such because those are just set theory as we've now discussed at length, but the fact that we use notions like independence to simplify computation. And Kolmogorov thought that that was one of the biggest tasks for, for philosophers when studying the notion of probability. Maybe that's something for you to think about as well. Thank you for your time.